What's up, y'all? Welcome to another Perspectives Podcast. This is Chase here. Joshua is still living it up down in Brazil, so it's just me for today. And really excited for today's episode. Uh, today, we have on uh, a dear friend, a recording artist with Reach Records, a father, um, a son, a fellow Christian, and a fellow frequent traveler. Definitely super grateful that he's able to <laughs> carve out a little bit of time and the busy schedule. We got Tadashi. <laughs> On yeah, today. Man. Hey man, thank you for having me. Man, bro. how have you been? Man, I've been well. I've been well. Um, shout out to Joe Sway, who uh I envy right now. Uh for going real. to live it up somewhere else. I, I need that break. But uh no, nah, I've been well, man. It's been a good season of um of wellness, pursuing health holistically and and really just, you know, being home as a family and uh just trying to have a sense of of rhythm. Yeah. At home, you know, so it's been good. Yeah. So good, man. And thank you for carving out the time. Yeah, I know. bro. You know, it's, if I, if I could make it, I'm making it happen. So I'm excited to be here. <laughs> for real, man. I got a flight to catch here in a little bit yes, too. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so it'll be good, man. But awesome. So yeah, today uh, with the podcast, just kind of being about missions, yeah. travel, everything like that. Um, recently you got the opportunity to go to Israel mm-hmm. with Israel Collective, mm-hmm. but as well, you've traveled a lot in yeah, your past. Yeah. And so uh, we just kind of wanted to start out today with just kind of talking about how you, how the Lord led you into missions, mm-hmm. how the Lord led you into travel, just how all that come up and just some general lessons that you've kind of learned yeah, from yeah, different yeah. trips and experiences. Man, my first experience with missions was when I was, um, I was probably a sophomore in college Yeah, and um, I'd gotten saved the year before. And uh, my sophomore year, any sort of mission, outreach, anything, the first thing that I had done uh, in this town in Texas called Waco, Texas, yeah. uh, I was going to Baylor, and there was a mit- there was an organization there called Mission Waco, and their okay. objective was to reach um, the homeless and the impoverished of the city, yeah. and they had this uh, thing they did called Church Under the Bridge, and yeah. it was right off of Fifth Street, yep. and they would go and have church out there. On Sunday, and invite all of the uh, all of the homeless, all of those who were staying in shelters, yeah. people just to come out, and they would feed them. They they do worship services and minister to them, um, which I had never seen before. But you know, learned later, those type of things were typical. Yeah. But something that they did that wasn't typical that I got to participate in was um, you could go and spend the weekend with a homeless community and live like they live. Yeah. And so it was basically you, a leader from the mission, and another person, and you would go out and you would basically live like they live under the bridge, in the park, on a park bench, yeah. somewhere downtown, wherever they were spotting up for the night, you would go with them. Yeah. And you'd basically live from Friday night until Sunday morning when the service took place mm-hmm. in in sort of the footsteps of someone who was homeless yeah. uh, to one, serve them, but two, to get a real sense, as much as you could in that moment, mm-hmm. a real sense of, of what people may deal with. And man, that was one of the first moments that I had with with real life tangible touches with someone who was without a home, without an income, without... Um, a sense of stability yeah. that we would call stability in our mm-hmm. everyday life, bro, it rocked me. It educated me. It broke my heart. It moved me into a lot of habits that I have now because of that experience, man. Yeah. I Just a quick story. I met a dude who, he was a professor in college at uh, the University of Illinois. And because of an alcohol addiction, lost his job, lost his wife, lost his family, Dang. lost his home. And then eventually um, the addiction kind of controlled him holistically and he mm-hmm. found himself on the street begging for money so he could get alcohol. Jeez. And and I learned later that this type of transparency is rare. But mm-hmm. in my time with him, he said, young man, I want to tell you something. I don't know where the help is going to come from, mm-hmm. but I hope it comes from somewhere. He said, when you... And he, he said, look at this. And he picked up this, this liquor bottle. And he said, when you see this bottle, what do you see? I was like, an empty bottle. He said, you know what I see? I see the corner of liquor left at the bottom of the bottle. And I wonder to myself, why would anyone waste that? And yeah. then he took it and turned it up. Now, this wasn't a bottle he had with him. This was a bottle on the street it's next on the street, to us. Yeah. 
And so, man, I just saw firsthand, these are real people. These aren't, for the most part, swindlers and scam artists and people out to get you. Though that exists, um, it, it taught me that my first inclination is shouldn't be to protect myself, yeah. but to consider another. Yeah. It was big for me. And then to know, like, man, this is, I mean, he had a PhD and <laughs> yeah. and was smarter than most of the people that I ever knew. Um, but this didn't have anything to do with intelligence as much as it did a sickness. Yeah. And he had an addiction. And this addiction was was causing this issue in his life of homelessness. And that was my first moment in the missions. It was, yeah. it revolutionized my, my thinking, man. Yeah. And it's so cool because kind of talking to just the part about <sighs> seeing him and the spirit of generosity mm-hmm. hitting you, something that hit me a couple years ago. Um, cause there's friends around who, I mean, there's, there's obviously people who are swindlers and mm-hmm. just manipulators and things like that. Um, but I was out with some friends and gave, uh, this homeless guy on the side of the street, just 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. And some friends were like, Hey, like, why are you doing that? Like, it looks like he's just like trying to get everyone's money whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know what it was. Cause I'd never thought this before, but like the Lord hit me. and was just like, Hey, it's not the validity of the person's asking that is the commandment. It's your generosity. That's a commandment. Like mm. your generosity isn't contingent on that person's mm-hmm. situation. Like, that's good. cause even if like, say it's your cousin mm-hmm. who just needs some money for rent, like you're, you're called to be generous there. Mm-hmm. Like they mm-hmm. aren't even homeless. They aren't super desperate, but yep. they just need money for rent. Yeah. And so it's something that the generosity should be inside of you. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so cool that the Lord started out, showing you missions, getting you involved with missions with something domestically. Yeah, bro. Because that's something in specifically like vocational missions that can be difficult is mm-hmm. finding that balance mm-hmm. between international and domestic missions. And that's something we're trying to strive for yeah. and be intentional about. Yeah. So it's so, so cool, man. And so at what point did you did you get involved with international missions? Uh, my first international missions trip was when I was... I went to, oh, I went to Mexico. Sorry. I was like, it wasn't when I was in Dallas. I was, that was before Dallas Uh when I lived in Houston and we went down to Mexico. Sweet. Um, And I honestly don't know the city because it was just right across the border. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, but we went and the whole goal was just to serve the people there. Yeah. And so it was a lot of service projects. um, But really what I didn't realize was happening because, you know, you, (laughs) you go with your own worldview and background and experiences expectations and expectations and you kind of drag that in with you yeah and and you never really take note of what's going on around you Mm -hmm. you you take note of what you're told to see um but on that trip i I gained eyes to see i think honestly what the spirit would show me and in that moment i saw people with a heart of gratitude for me doing what I would do on a Saturday morning for my mom. Yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go dig this trench, or I'm gonna pull these flowers up, or these <laughs> weeds out of these flower, this flower bed, or yeah. I'm gonna help plant seeds over here, and you know, things that just you know, being a country kid, we did yeah. that were normative, and I would have done for my mom, my aunt, anybody. In this moment, it was being called special or yeah. unique. And I was like, no, this is my reasonable service. This is <laughs> this makes sense now. I get it. So yeah. that was our first encounter going outside the country. Um, and then uh, there was just that led to me moving to Dallas eventually and a lot of domestic stuff yeah. from doing service projects in Chicago for like 10 years straight to doing work in um, Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh-huh. to Lula, Louisiana, and just really going to different cities in the country to serve people who were either less fortunate or without or um, with organizations that were doing work that I kind of took note of and wanted to be a part of. Yeah, man, that's so good. And something that kind of related to international missions and kind of going on past the Mexico trip, Mm -hmm. uh, something that we talked about whenever I was out here in Atlanta Mm -hmm. in November Mm -hmm. was this experience you went through when coming back from a trip to South Sudan. Yeah, Sudan, yep. Now and, known as South Sudan, but yeah. Yeah, and so it was it was something that kind of, whenever you mentioned it, like really hit me because mm-hmm. it's something that I know I've struggled with at times. Yeah. And I feel like a good amount of people coming back from missions mm-hmm. struggle with. 
um, because we can be hit with counterculture shock Mm -hmm. um, or just like a genuine passion with wanting to make a difference. Mm -hmm. But that kind of being cranked up to 12 or 15 (laughs) at times. And so you were talking a little bit about um, just this experience, um, some of the things that was kind of going against you. And so do you want to talk a little bit about that and provide advice? Bro, look, I, first of all, man, um, hello to everybody in Ye, South Sudan, um, (laughs) man, hello to Bishop Taban and like just that community of people, man. So I I went with a group of leaders and the goal was to go and do a, um, a few service projects, uh, meet some local officials and then do like a Bible conference, you know, take these high topics that we glean from scripture and these pillars or essentials to our faith and kind of walk these men through these things that we learn. Yeah. And we went with, um, I would say people went with humble hearts and went with a, a spirit of service. And we, I think that was true. There was, a, yeah. there was genuine generosity at heart and all of that. But when I arrived, we got to the village and there was just, now you got to remember, this is a third world country yeah. by, by definition. And so most of these people were living in, Homes made of mud and sticks and straw. Yeah. Uh, the floor is the actual ground where the grass has been stomped and beat away, yeah. pulled up. And everybody had this giant community stove, oven, barbecue pit type thing yeah. that they cooked with. Um, and the kids were um, just lived in this area where they were kind of free to roam and play sports. And we arrive and there's everybody there from the village singing to us and welcoming us to their community. Yeah. And that was amazing. It was beautiful. It gave me chills. It gave me joy. Then we get into the the day one, two, you know, activities for while we're there. And we st- start talking to people, meeting people. And not to any fault of the leadership, but when you're taking people overseas, you tend to really kind of harp and hone on the the goal, the the things we need to be mindful of. As missionaries, as Americans, as <laughs> people coming into a different culture, yeah. there's all these things. But you know, you get prepared in a certain way, where the unknowns kind of grow. They kind of produce a sense of fear, but at the same time, expectation. Yeah. And man, I went thinking I was gonna be, and not in some arrogant way, but I thought I was gonna go be a a, a benefit, a help, a helper. Yeah. Um, an enlightener. <laughs> to the people, man. And yeah. day one, I, I was humbled. Day two, the humility brought about this sense of awakening to my unknown entitlement Ooh. that then led to like a stinging, almost piercing resolution or realization that I was I was arrogant and I didn't know it. Yeah. And my buddy says it, he says it's um it's like a, a odorless gas. Um, this <laughs> thing that's in America where we walk, talk, and think without having to have regard for certain things that people deal with yeah. in the outside world. Like I may learn world history, but I don't have to engage the world the way the world has to engage America. Yeah. By sheer power, the America has so much privilege and and so much, I don't know, man, just accessibility to things that others don't. And just like default influence as well. Default influence. Yeah, there's, I I have access to certain things that other people long to see or have that that are commonplace in my life. And so I went to a place where there were people who looked up to us because we were American, but it was, it was saddening to me because I came with the first, like, first stamped on my heart is Christ. So I went with this idea of, as a Christian, I want to go serve my Christian brothers and sisters. And when I got there, I I felt like I was being treated special. Um, A lot of times I I hear Christians speak about um, certain things that go on in in America that we should rally up and stand against. Um, Whether it's on a political front or a spiritual front, you find people taking on taking up arms against certain agendas and so we fight homelessness and we battle poverty and we take a stand against abortion and we speak on certain things that i think are important that i would agree with the stances yeah 
Nevertheless, there's this thing that we don't talk about in America that I, I've only recognized about myself when I've had the chance to go overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's kind of wrapped in a sense of pride, arrogance, and entitlement, but it's the, it's the sin of partiality. <laughs> we are partial to what we have preference for. Yeah. And so it's not clear that I'm privileged when I'm amongst the privileged. Yeah. It's only clear when I go to those who have less than. And when I went to this third world country who, where people lived that had less than me, I saw myself entitled. I saw myself privileged. Yeah. And then furthermore, it was reinforced when they, for no reason at all, they don't know me, but for whatever reason, they're looking up to me. Now, I get it. There's a sense of where you show honor to teachers or you show respect to elders. I understand that. Yeah. But th- these people are older than me, wiser in some regard and experiences that I have never had. Mm-hmm. And yet they, they've they abased themselves before me. And I was so broken by that, that I... I I repented. I went to the Lord and I was like, God, I'm sorry mm. for ever coming over here assuming that I had the answer wow. and they needed it. Now, that that's not a hang up that I would put on every person in America yeah. or every Christian. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't assume that's everyone. But if we're honest, that's a lot of us, yeah. more than we realize. And you don't see it because we're in the odorless gas of privilege yeah. and entitlement. And it woos us into this lullaby, into this dream state that I have what someone needs. Even in how I approach people now domestically with the gospel, yes, you need the truth of the Lord, but you don't need me. You need the truth of the Lord. It's like, it humbled me, man. I was like, yes, praise God, I'm the vessel, but man, I'm not the message. The gospel's the message. You need that. So when I went overseas and sat with believing brothers and sisters, the gospel unified us. It didn't make me your leader. And so I was so humbled in that moment, broken that. So I taught on the Trinity, which I was like, thanks guys. Everybody <laughs> else was like, Oh, I'm gonna teach missions and evangelism, <laughs> church organization and structure. And I'm like, I get the Trinity. Thanks. <laughs> and I, and honestly, they were like, we picked you. I was like, sure you did. Woo. Thanks. Thanks. Of course you did. Thanks for that honor. Mm-hmm. You guys went through and discussed it. And then when I got there late, as I normally am, unfortunately, uh. I, I got I got the short, short end of the straw, so to speak. But I was like, cool, I got it. And so I studied, went in to teach. But one of the things I did on the last day of teaching was in teaching about the Trinity, I wanted to communicate how, if you consider the idea of the triune God and how there is a willingness to show glory to the one before. Yeah. It's like God the Father is glorified by the Son, but God the Son is glorified by the work of the Spirit who came to work with us and alongside of us and in us. Yeah. And there's this unique picture of them working together while being of one essence. Yeah. And I, I use that as a way to communicate my heart to show them I'm no better. I'm just different in function. Yep. And if you show me glory, it's not to exalt me, but to honor God in heaven. Mm-hmm. And so I want to now show you glory and honor you yeah. and glorify God. So I got down. I took one of the pastors who I've been talking to all week, mm-hmm. sat him in a seat, got down on my hands and knees, grabbed a basin, filled it with water, and washed his feet. Amen. And then I took my shirt off and I dried his feet with my shirt. Yeah. And then I sat there and said, I love you. You're my brother. And the God who exists three in one loves you the same. Yeah. We are co-heirs. I'm not your leader, but I'm honored to serve you by teaching you something you may not know or yep. understand. From that moment on, it was as if they saw us as one because they were like, this American touched my feet. Yeah. This guy who would could come who could have come here and saw us as less than or gross or nasty. And for most people, feet are gross anyway. But <laughs> to see what Christ did to those who would normally put him on a pedestal, mm-hmm. I was like, don't put me on a pedestal. Let me come to you now. Yeah. And I didn't view it as condescending. I, I saw it as this moment of exalting him. Yeah. And unto the Lord. And it was 
It was amazing, bro. It changed yeah. my so I mean, literally, I I will wash a brother's feet. I was like, I, even here, like, man, let me honor you today and wash your feet in the ceremony. Yeah. And then just pray together. And then um we can go hang out and go go get wings or something. I don't know. But <laughs> but that's the that's the mindset that going to that place taught me. And I was like, man, I I pray we all get a chance to go overseas outside of the odorless gas. Yeah. And take note of ourselves that we do live in a culture of partiality and preference, yeah. that we are privileged in comparison to other countries. And un, unbeknownst to us, it can easily produce a sense of entitlement yeah. that we then should be battling against. Dang, and it's so good. And I love that illustration of odorless gas because yeah, going to another culture is like breathing in fresh air yes bro and, it is like mm. it's amazing and I, I mean that's one of the reasons why i love to travel why mm-hmm. i love missions and it's mm-hmm. and it's so good because for us to properly go into another country mm-hmm. um like we we can't just assume that our culture is better like yes. we can't just assume that, that i think there are I think we would just agree there's characteristics of our culture that are very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But every culture has something unique in it that's yep. so valuable that God placed in that culture for a reason. Yep. Um, and as well, like our allegiance should be to the culture of heaven. Very much so, bro. Over yeah. the culture of the country that we live in, whether it's America, Costa Rica, Sudan. Yeah, or Brazil. Shout out to <laughs> shout out to Josh Way. <laughs> for real. Um, but no, like I love that because you – you, you, it's hard to see, and I, I don't put this on anyone, so I say it knowing we're all prone to it, yep. but you can easily fall into the trap of not just going to another country and thinking your culture is better, so therefore you're better or what you have is better. And I don't think any, anyone would use those words per se, Yeah. but we even begin to teach with a tone and with a, an approach of better. Yeah. And unknowingly, we're... We're either talking down to or or talking at someone, mm-hmm. or we are seeing people now as objects of like winning versus souls in a body yeah. who need Jesus. Yeah. It's like I'm you're not my objective. You are God's creation in his image who needs to know Jesus. Amen. It's it's a difference, man. And and that thin line can be crossed so easily if we don't lay to rest or at least buffet our our conscience and our bodies in this area of recognizing that we can have a sense of of cultural and personal and even spiritual or religious entitlement or arrogance and pride and so the trip humbled me bro like like crazy and so I love. I say it now all the time with my boys. I'm like, as so, like people on the road will ask me. Um, we say it on tour. When I say my boys, I mean dudes are the are other artists that I'm on tour with. But, yeah. But we'll say it sometimes when people in Q and As or whatever they'll go, "Hey man, so um, you guys are always on stage or in front of people. How do you stay humble? Like, how do you stay humble, man, with all yeah. the money and all the fame and all the whatever?" And I was like, first of all, ain't nobody <laughs> famous." <laughs> If you find money, tell me where it is because I need it. But um, uh, my wife would definitely be like, where the money at? Because I you need that. Um, but but really what I, I started answering was like, man, I, I serve others. And I, go, I do that a lot by trying to get out of the country. Because yeah. it's hard to see. It's almost like um, when I did Mission Waco and we did the homeless outreach and I was there from Friday to Sunday afternoon, yeah. there were other opportunities of ministry outlets at the school that you could participate mm-hmm. in. And I picked that one because what I what I felt like, what, with other ones, what I felt like was happening was it was a Christian pep rally. Yeah. And we would buddy-buddy pep rally. And you need encouragement. You need mutual edification. That's fine. Yeah. But it became the norm instead of almost knowing that you're, you will be um, dying to self in mm. this moment. And so there was no dying to self to get with the Christian pep rally and buddy, buddy, and go out and do do a project. Yeah, To go somewhere where I had to die to self, my spiritual father was like, that's what you need to do. Mm-hmm. We don't need to go somewhere where we will be celebrated or where we will be a part of the celebration. Yeah. We need to go where the work is. And so I was like, oh, 
like the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. few. But the the few is not just because there aren't enough Christians or people aren't necessarily wanting to go. Some are going, but it's to the pep rallies. It's and in to the wrong the, way. Yeah. And, and yeah, and I'm like, no, nah, I don't want that. I want to go where I got to die to self. And so that's kind of been my MO now. So I'm like, all right, where can I go that I'm going to die to self? Where, where can I go now that it won't be about me in any capacity as a person, a man, as a person, as a man, as a... Um, artist or any of that. Where can I go and it'll be about the work? Yeah. And so I'm hoping people start to take on that perspective of missions where it's less about the the badge that you get, but more about the the work done and the and the and what you're able to leave behind. Amen. So good, man. And we only got a few minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Um so and I want to honor your time. So uh Israel trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I recorded uh with with uh, Tony Tillman, yeah, Tony, up man. in Nashville mm-hmm. a couple of days ago, uh, so he was able to talk about the trip some, and uh, as well, we've had some people on who have talked about Israel Collective and mm-hmm. everything that they're doing. Shout out to them, they're doing amazing Bro, work. Shout out to Israel Collective. Shout out to my man, Derek Miner. Have you had him on the show yet? Not yet. Bro, you got to get Derek Miner on the show, bro. He's amazing. He's also doing some em- empowerment stuff right now with business ownership yep. and black community. It's it's amazing. It's beautiful. So yeah. um, Derek Miner, who runs RMG Reflection, Reflection Music. Music Group, where Tony is an artist. Yep. Um, so Derek went on the trip last year uh, or the year before yep. and was like, yo, y'all got to come. And I had the opportunity to go on the same trip that Derek went on. Yeah. But I told him, I was like, um, I've been overseas for the artist moments. It ain't always organized. <laughs> I'm kind of good on that. And then you want me to go to Israel? Out of all places. Out of all places. <laughs> Though I'm excited to go to the Holy Land, I'm not excited about being that far from home, that long away from my family, and it being unorganized yeah. and not safe. I'm good, bro. Yeah. And... um he was like, trust me, you'll love it. And then he worked it out, and the Israel Collective was kind enough to allow the wives to come on the trip. Yep. And I say it that way more so because it was a budget thing more than it was whether or not wives could come. There were other women on the trip, but yep. there was definitely this moment where I was like, if my wife can go, and if it's safe, and if you're going to be on it, I'm going. Yep. So for this trip, there was Tony, his wife, Derek, his wife, me and my wife, yep. uh, Andy Minio, his wife, Lecrae, his wife. My other boy, BJ, who runs uh, Build a Better yeah. Us. Um, BJ was there with his wife. Yeah. And it was just a lot of different people we already knew. Some we didn't, but there were wives, there were husbands, and there was yeah. couples. So it was so good. It was such a great trip, man. Um, two, two highlights from the trip that I feel like they did a great job of. Mm-hmm. Um, the first was taking us to um, the different sites. Yeah. My favorite site was definitely the Garden of Gethsemane. Ooh. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And it was it was one of my favorite man because it of the so many implications of that that moment in 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 Christ's life yeah. in the scriptures that moment in the disciples' life yeah um, you had a guy who was like I'm never going to betray you um, but the inklings of that the foreshadowing of that was there because he couldn't stay awake it's mm. like oh man come on bro I need you wow but as you as I stood in that garden. That I honestly didn't know was an olive tree garden. I was like, oh, that's what it was. Okay. Damn. I'm thinking petunias and tulips and <laughs> whatever well else. Done. No, it's an olive tree garden. Not to mention, when I read it in scripture with my American Hollywood influenced mind, I I pictured acres of land mm-hmm. or giant open fields. Yeah. I pictured a garden that was massive where he was walking through basically Sherwood Forest. Yeah, <laughs> like the miles wood, on miles. Yeah, bro. The wooded area of um, the backside of some green belt. And it's like, no, he was in an area that was the size of an end zone, mm-hmm. not a football field, but just the end zone. Yeah. And when I got that, I was like, oh, wow, okay. So the garden sits on a hill mm-hmm. and it's across from one of the most amazing sites in the city. And as Jesus is here getting ready to pray, he goes a little further in, which would only mean like maybe five yards away. Yeah. Because uh, we're at football. Um, For real. field reference but he's only five yards away they're falling asleep he's praying god is not answering his request no. um so so god's not answering the request jesus is 
sweating drops of blood and and feeling the angst of the moment. Yeah. His friends are asleep. It's on the hill. There's no fence, no nothing. It's it's the wind comes across the hill. You can hear and smell when other people are coming. So mm. the soldiers you're like he knew they were asleep because he could hear there was no activity. Yeah. And he looks around and they're asleep. But you can also hear people coming up the hill. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't he wasn't a, aloof to the idea that people were coming. And he yeah. knew who it was yeah. sovereignly, but you kind of know like here's in his humanity, I got the enemy approaching. Yeah. With one of my own who betrayed me, my friends who are asleep, and my father who won't take my request. Yeah. And blood is pouring from my pores. That scene, bro, and I was just like, I broke, and I just mm. cried, and I cried when I saw the real scene. Yeah. Uh, the other moment was when we got to go to the um, Gaza Strip, mm. and we okay. were a mile away from the wall that separated Israel from Palestine. Yeah. And it 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 was such a real moment, bro, when um, the guide was there with us, and someone was like, "Are we safe?" And he was like. Mm, today, yes. And we were like, <laughs> like, did you call a truce on today for some <laughs> reason? Like, what happened? And he said, well, no, but they bombed us two, no, three days ago. <laughs> they probably won't bomb again for another week. Oh, my God. And I was like, excuse me? And then he showed us the shells and mortar where bombs have been dropped. Yeah. And this is a community that sits, again, like a mile and a half away from the wall. Yeah. But we walked to an area where the wall was a mile away. Yeah. And we could literally see soldiers on top of the wall walking. And um, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it because I had to I had to face my fear, buffet my body. I loved it because I had to trust the Lord in so many ways. But I also loved it because my man who lived there looked at me and I said, bro, why don't you just move? Why don't you just leave? Take your family. Get out of here. Yeah. And he said, what would that say to my children? What Ooh. would that say to my wife? We believe God is real. We yeah. believe God is for us. We believe God gave us this land. If all of these are true and what we believe, then why would I leave? Yeah. Why would I run from my land? Why would I run from the promise of God? And my jaw dropped, tears fell, and then I looked at my wife and I was like, I ain't got it like that. (laughs) I ain't got it like that. What? Here, it's not safe. Run. That's the it's just clear. Hey. You live in the hood, you're doing ministry, but they shooting every night. Run. So where I live now, one street over, there's drug raids, there's gunshots every other day. And it's Atlanta, so you might hear gunshots anyway somewhere. But yeah. where I live, one street over, is happening. It's hot. And people are like, just move. And I'm like, no, we're safe. But even if we weren't, there's a level of like, I walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. I don't walk by foolishness, and God doesn't call me to be foolish. But he does call me to faith. And so... I'm discerning based on the spirit what that line looks like. And for right now, we are where we are. And yeah. I looked at my wife and I was like, I ain't got it like that though. Like <laughs> there's still growth that needs to take place. Bro, there are bomb shelters in the community. There's a bomb yeah. shelter at the bus stop, bomb shelter at the pool, bomb shelter at the house, bomb shelter in the garage, bomb Gosh. shelter at the school, in the gym. Just blows your mind. And then you look and you're like, oh, look at this wall. Oh, those are bullets. <laughs> those, are, those are bullet holes. Okay. <laughs> this is real. And your children live here and your family is here. As soon as the sirens come on, you're yanking your kids up and running into the, the bomb shelter. Yeah. And you're like, what? But he's confident my faith in God will outweigh any fear that we have. Yeah. And my kids will see that. Dang. I was like, wow. So it just moved me, bro, in a major way. I and I love the trip. Anybody that gets a chance to go with the Israel Collective, you should do it. I'm trying to go back again <laughs> with them. Yeah. And so they have no choice. I'm going. I don't care what they hey. say. Um, so it's happening. But yeah, I loved it. Thanks. So good. And yeah, I've talked with Derek about it before. Mm-hmm. And like Kirby. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, Kirby. She went yep. with Derek yeah. uh, in 2018. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And so yeah. that's where they met. Bro, it's fire, bro. She's told me about it. Crazy, man. But dude, thank you so much just for coming on yeah i'm glad i could be here everything man so all right y'all that'll be a wrap for us today again thanks to 
Tadashi for taking the time to join us. Uh, we'll link all of his info mm-hmm. down in the description. Um, as well, if you'd like to support our work and mission here at Perspectives, um, you could always just go to our website down below, make a donation, uh, keep us being able to organize these trips, hosting these podcasts, everything like that. Uh, if you like today's episode, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And much love. God bless. Yeah.